value in looking and reading through the text, so I would like you to follow as we pick up in Acts 9 and in verse 19, which in most of our Bibles, that's kind of a mid-sentence, mid-verse place that we pick up. But it starts off by saying, now for several days, he, and let's pause for a moment and say the he referred to as the Apostle Paul, for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. And when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. High school yearbooks typically list categories for graduating seniors. You might have had your name listed like way, way back when you were a senior. But captions that are listed there like most likely to succeed, least likely to get married, most likely to move to another state and, or another country even, and on and on. If the Apostle Paul were to be listed in a yearbook, I suppose the caption that would have been most appropriate for him would have been least likely to become a follower of Christ, right? Because Paul was a very unlikely convert. We've just been reading about, he was on what he thought was a God-given mission to rid the earth of followers of Christ. And lo and behold, he becomes a follower in a rather dramatic way. A few weeks ago, Levi shared an excellent message about Saul, who we know as Paul, his conversion experience. And I know it's kind of an application to his message. He spoke about those people that we know that we'd likely say are the least likely to become a follower of Christ. Who is it that we know that we would be surprised, if not shocked, that they were born again and became a follower of Christ? And again, I recall Levi made the point that we ought never to write anybody off. Paul's a great example. Many people would likely want to write him off and say, there's no way that he's going to be a follower of Christ. Uh, Christ had his way with Paul, as we read about here. Then now his life as a new believer, as a new follower of Christ. His conversion story, of course, is dramatic blinded by the noonday sun, and I think that says a great deal. How bright is the sun in Arizona? Pretty bright. Imagine a light brighter than our noonday sun. That's the light of Christ that, that shone upon Paul, and of course he heard the voice of Jesus, and he surrendered his life in that dramatic moment. He was directed to the city of Damascus in Syria, and he met a follower of Christ by the name of Ananias. And I'd like us to back up for just a few moments to verses 10 to 14 here in chapter 9 because we see a bit about the experience of, of uh, Saul coming to Damascus. It says, there was a disciple, verse 10, at Damascus named Ananias. 
And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on his name. You'd be skeptical, too, if you were Ananias, if you'd heard about this man Saul and what it was that he was doing, and now this amazing uh, insight given to him that he's become a follower of Christ. And so although Ananias was skeptical, he was obedient. He sought out Saul. And if we look in verses 17 to the first part of 19 to back up just a little before the text we've looked at, it says, Ananias departed. He entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, I like this, brother Saul, I guess he's stepping out on faith realizing he really has become a brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me, to, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized and he took food and he was strengthened. Saul regained his sight. He was blinded by that bright noonday light. We're told here that he took the step of water baptism. Stopped by at the local diner. Well, maybe not. It says he had some food, wherever that came from. And he spent some time, we're told, with the believers there in Damascus. Why linger on these points? Because these are very important first steps for a new believer. That's why I think it's important that we take a look at this and consider. First of all, we noted that Paul regained his physical sight. Indeed, he was physically blind, but I think there's more to it than just that. I think that regaining his physical sight was a type of metaphor for spiritual sight and spiritual insight. As the hymn writer says, once I was blind, but now I see. Paul could say that on two different levels. Paul submitted, we are told here, to baptism. I think that's extremely significant. One of the most frequent questions that I've been asked over the years as a pastor is the question of, is it necessary to be baptized? That's just this outward thing. How necessary is that? I think we have a very powerful example right here with the Apostle Paul, don't we? We might say, if Paul the Apostle thought it was important to be baptized, well, shouldn't we as well? That's only one of many reasons why, indeed, we ought to be baptized. I know I've shared my story with you before, but as a teenager, I was a, well, I'm going to use the word stubborn, and that doesn't just apply to being a teenager, that applies to most of my life. But as a teenager, I was a stubborn, what I would call, closet follower of Jesus, There did come a time in my life when I felt I needed to give my life to Christ, and I privately, silently did so. And I thought it was a a personal, private sort of a thing between me and Jesus, and I did that. But I resisted water baptism, resisted it for some time, and I had people talking to me about that. Don't you think you ought to be baptized? Again, I was stubborn, still stubborn, but I was really stubborn at that time. Up until the point that I was challenged by someone who, in essence, raised this question. If your faith is so real, then why are you not doing what is clearly taught and you clearly see in Scripture? And I did not have a good answer to that. I knew about water baptism. I saw it. I saw the many verses. I had heard about it. And I knew that that's what was taught in Scripture. And I realized I needed to humble myself and I needed to submit to water baptism. Water baptism is very, very important. Baptism is a huge topic. We could spend the rest of the time just talking about that alone. We don't have time for that, but there's a couple things that we certainly do want to point out again following Paul's example here. First of all, the fact that Jesus himself says it's necessary. 
and you don't have any higher authority than the words of Jesus. John 3, 5 is a verse that ought to burn into the minds of each one of us because if anybody says, is baptism necessary, how about we just go to the words of Jesus rather than what we might think about it? And how do you dispute what he says in John 3, 5 when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, notice this, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He cannot, not my words, Jesus' words, I think that's the highest authority of all. It is essential if we desire to enter the kingdom of God. One other passage, just quickly, while we're talking about baptism. The day of Pentecost, we read about that some time ago in our study out of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 is also one of those highlight verses. After Peter gave a dynamic presentation of the gospel for the very first time, and people were cut to the heart, what shall we do? His answer is so very important. Acts 2.38, he said to them, repent, reorient your thinking, change your mind, change your life, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We sure need that. And then you will receive the gift of Holy Spirit. You can't live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Right there, Acts 2.38, we have all those essentials laid out for us. There again, if Paul thought it important to be baptized, that's just one of many reasons why water baptism is of the utmost importance. Looking further at what Paul did as a new believer, as we noted, he ate a meal, he needed some nourishment, but he fellowshiped with other believers. He thought it important to hang out with others who were followers of Christ. Again, going back to Acts 2 that we looked at some time ago, the very first in-gathering of believers, we note that they did the same thing. So if something's repeated as it is here, we see it's important. Acts 2 in verse 46 says that after these believers came in, they were baptized that day. It says, day by day, they continued with one mind in the temple. They were devoted to fellowship and worship in the temple. They were breaking bread from house to house. And they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They combined two very important and enjoyable things. Being together with other believers and having a meal together. It doesn't get much better than that. So they devoted themselves to those things. Paul, again, ate a meal, but Paul was together with other believers in Damascus. It points up by example that fellowship, connectivity with other believers is important. So we heard it said, no man is an island. No believer is an island. And so uh, we realize that we need to be with others. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know because you came together here on a Sunday morning or you're joining us by way of the Internet to be together. We know it's important. But indeed it is. It is vitally important that we share together. Someone once said that the church, no matter how imperfect, is our best hope for spiritual vitality. Without it, there is not the slightest chance that we will survive spiritually. And I could not agree more with those words. Ah, the church is, the church is not perfect, but it, it is essential for our spiritual vitality. Imperfect our own. We got to be together. And so it's important that we do so. So I totally agree with the individual who spoke those words. Verse 20 that we read in our text here, we see the very first message of the Apostle Paul. I believe that first words and last words are the most important words. So what was it that Paul said first thing as a new believer? You'll see it verse 20, verse 22. Two things that he said, really he's saying one thing. He said, he, Jesus, is the Son of God. What an important phrase. He is the Son of God. Verse 22 says that he was proving that this Jesus is the Christ. We said before, Christ is not the last name. Jesus was not the son of Joseph and Mary. Christ, Christ is Messiah, Son of God. So he's saying the same thing. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. A respected seminary professor once said, 
To be called the Son of God out of necessity means that one cannot be God. That's pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand. And it ought to be simple. The tragedy is it's not that simple in Christian circles. But for example, if I stand before you this morning and I say, I am the son of Frank Taylor, you would probably not for a moment say, oh, well, you're saying that you are Frank Taylor. No, <laughs> I am Frank Taylor's son. It makes it very, very clear we're two distinct individuals, doesn't it? Again, I'm not telling you things you don't know here. This should be pretty plain and simple. The tragedy is over the last 1,800 years, Many have taken this idea when Jesus said he's the son of God, in essence, what he's saying is, well, I'm actually my father. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So we understand. When Paul begins with this important message, he is the son of God, uh, it was a big enough deal that the creator of the universe had fathered a son. That was a pretty big deal. But it's very, very clear in what Paul is saying that he is the son of God. We stake our claim on that, don't we? That was Peter's great confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus built his church upon that confession. Legacy is that we are, are those people who believe in that confession as well. He is the Son of God, and our faith is based upon that. Well, because of what the Apostle Paul preached, as we read in our text here, the Jews were very much threatened by his message, and they were determined to kill him. And so secretly, Paul, we are told, was sent away, and he went to the city of Jerusalem. And if you've been following any of these kind of interesting coincidence in our daily readings, Galatians chapters 1 and 2 were two chapters that we read this past week, very important chapters to dovetail with what we read here. So if you want more detail about what happened with the Apostle Paul after his conversion, uh, Galatians 1 and 2 gives us a lot more information there. And so that fits exactly with what we look at here. But go back to verse 26 here in chapter 9, that when Paul came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. And we can understand that. This is a little bit too much to grasp, but this man out killing followers of Christ is now one of us, at least so he says. And so those people had every reason to be afraid of Paul based upon his past behavior. Is this man really a changed individual? Is this a new tactic to trip up followers of Christ and have additional ones killed as well? So really it's a watershed moment. Paul professes his faith. The believers are not willing to believe that he has been indeed born again. And so really we come to a watershed moment. The Apostle Paul could have very easily been rejected. He could have been ostracized. Paul might never have gone on to have the impact that he did. But what I want us to notice is there was one man who made a huge difference as such. We are very much grateful to him for the difference that he made. Again, look back at verse 27. It says, but Barnabas took hold of him, took hold of Paul, and brought him to the apostles. And notice what he did. He described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had talked to him, and, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas made all the difference. I have so much respect for this man, Barnabas. And this is not the first time we've heard about him, have we, in our study of Acts? Don't need to turn back there, but in chapter 4, verse 17, that's the first time we hear about him. I should say chapter 4, verse 37. Got the wrong verse there. But we read about the fact that he had a plot of land that he sold. He took all the proceeds, all the money that he made from the sale of that land. He brought it to the apostles and laid it at their feet for them to distribute to whoever was needy within the church. So the first thing we know about him is that he was a very generous man. We learn that later on he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, who he's introducing to the church here. He traveled with him on his first missionary journey. That didn't turn out quite so well. We're told later on there was a sharp contention about a young man named John Mark. He kind of abandoned the work on that first journey. 
And uh, anyway, uh, Barnabas wanted to bring him along, and Paul said, nah, he's not reliable. Paraphrasing, obviously. Not a reliable young man, so we're not going to bring him along. And so they went separate ways. Uh, Paul would have a later change of heart near the end of his life. He says uh, that Mark is very much useful to him. But uh, regardless, that's uh, part of what we know about Barnabas. But, you know, even his real name was not Barnabas, we're told, because back in Acts 4, verse 36, we're told his actual name was Joseph. But the apostles, I think this is significant, the apostles gave him a nickname. They gave him the name Barnabas, which we are told means son of encouragement. I think that speaks volumes about the kind of man that he was. Yeah, his name's Joseph, but let's give him a name that fits who and what he really is. He is known to be an encourager, and what a tremendous compliment that, that they gave to him. And so his real name was overshadowed by this character trait of encouragement. He was widely known as an encourager. So we pause and think about encouragement and the power of encouragement. What is the power of an encouraging word? Here is a prime example in Acts 9 that we're looking at. We might never have known of the Apostle Paul if it were not for the encouragement of Barnabas. And it's hypothetical, but we'd have a much thinner Bible. About two-thirds of the New Testament would be gone because Paul was the human author. We're indebted to Barnabas for his encouragement. And I like what it says about how it was that he encouraged that he literally, for one thing, brought Paul face-to-face with the apostles. That had to be kind of risky. Let's get them together in the same room. And so he was willing to do that. And we notice that he shared Paul's conversion story. He wanted them to hear the story of Paul that they probably had not heard. And he spoke about what he firsthand had heard Paul was teaching back in Damascus. So what all that says to me is that Barnabas took the time to get to know this Apostle Paul, or this man Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul. He he got to know him and to encourage him as a new believer in the faith. And so uh, that factored in to him introducing Paul to those apostles in Jerusalem. Again, it's a great example that extends down to us. What's the power of encouragement? Well, you know, we may not be able to preach or to teach. Maybe you're not called to be an evangelist. Maybe you don't hold a position in the local church, but the fact of the matter is every one of us can be a Barnabas. Every one of us can be encouragers like Barnabas, and what a tremendous difference it can make. Proverbs 16, verse 24, said, Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. I think that's descriptive of what encouraging can do. If we would make it a point and a goal to be an encourager, our encouraging words, our gracious words, can be like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healthy to the body. Good words that can make a difference. Someone has said that we live by encouragement and we die without it. I think that is so true. It is so true. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, the Apostle Paul later on would write to the church at Thessalonica, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. So what a wonderful thing to be said of them. You're an encouraging church body and continue to do what it is that you're already doing because it is so valuable and helpful to others. And of course, the passage, if we're talking about encouragement, we cannot overlook this one, probably one that is so familiar to many of us. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, we refer to it often, but it's so important. Let us consider, let us consider thinking in advance how to stir one another on to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's just a whole lot out of two verses, but encouragement, according to those verses, I believe is a proactive thing when it says that we ought to consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds, to stir up and consider. That's something we do in advance, isn't it? Consider how to do this. Think about it before you come on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, or whenever it is. Think about how can I be an encourager to others? 
So let us consider how to do those things. Of course, not neglecting to meet together. Some people do that. We who are gathering here together are not doing that. So uh, meeting together. But as you meet together, making encouragement and increasing description of your gatherings as the day draws near. Man, I've been your pastor for, what, about 15 years, and I'm thinking about encouragement being more important now than it was 15 years ago when I came as your pastor. Because look at what's gone on in all this amount of time. Would we say times are better in our country and in the world than they were 15 years ago? I wouldn't for a minute say so. These are more challenging, difficult times. We need encouragement. We live, as the writer said, by encouragement. We die without it. So as the the followers of Christ, who are more and more pushed to the outskirts of our society, who are marginalized more and more, we've got to encourage one another if we're going to make it. And so that passage takes on greater urgency as we see the day approach. I believe the day is the end of this present age, just before the return of Christ. The increasing difficulties of the last days let us make encouragement a higher priority the more we come to that particular time. Verse 31, the last verse that we read out of our text this morning, it's a summary of what's been going on. About to introduce a whole other section in our study of Acts. But verse 31 says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace. They were being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church continued to increase. I wonder what kind of role Barnabas played in that being true of the church, of Barnabas who sought out, who encouraged, who brought Paul, Saul, into the fellowship of the church. And I think he did play a a part in that. And I think that's one more statement about the power of encouragement. When you and I make encouragement a priority, there can be peace within the body of Christ. We indeed are built up as members of the body of Christ when there is encouragement. We live and we serve in awe and respect of our Lord Jesus and God, our Heavenly Father. We experience more of the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And it's almost a footnote like we read in Acts 2, the end of Acts 2, 47, that when the church was focused on those kinds of things, God brought about growth. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being said, we find in Acts 2, 47. Later on, the Apostle Paul would write to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He said, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul was longing for that, looking forward to that. That's why he wanted to be together, so that there could be some mutual encouragement to each other's faith, to Paul's as well as to the church. That, I think, is the desire of us when we come together. We want to share together, as we're doing here this morning, that just being together, the practice of being together, we are encouraged and we encourage one another. Aspiring to encourage, I believe, is a mark of spiritual maturity. A mature church is an encouraging church. The focus is on the good and the potential of others. It's looking outside of self, looking to others, and how can I build up others? Indeed, we looked at a shining example of encouragement today, a man by the name of Barnabas, who who was renamed Barnabas, meaning the son of encouragement. Through generosity, as Barnabas was, uh, generosity with possessions as he was, generosity even with our time, we become encouragers. Again, a healthy church is characterized by encouragement. I think this local congregation has tremendous potential because we are characterized as encouragers. And as Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, let's just keep right on doing that because it is so very, very important. Through encouragement, you just never know what might happen. You might be pleasantly surprised at the unlikely individual who commits his or her life to Christ, even as the Apostle Paul did. We might find through encouragement someone unlikely will step up through service and ministry in some area that they might not would have in any other way. And just to make a great contribution to the well-being of other believers. So as we look again at the example of Barnabas, let me leave you with this challenge. Let's make sure that we be a Barnabas, be a son or a daughter of encouragement. 
and reap the blessings and give the blessings. Amen.